from the Lord, hallelujah, the message unto you I give, is recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live, let me live, my brother live, look at Jesus now and live, is recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. from above, hallelujah, Jesus said it and I know it is true, but can live, my brother live, look to Jesus now and live, it's recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live, life is offered unto you, hallelujah, eternal life thy soul shall have. If you only look to him, hallelujah, look to Jesus who alone can save. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Be recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. I will tell you how I think Hallelujah, through Jesus when he made me whole, was believing on his name, hallelujah, I trusted in to save my soul. Look to me, my brother, live, look to Jesus now and live, it's recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. prayer. Heavenly Father, thank the Lord that we can come to you and look to you, God, to live. Thank you one day I did. And God, you saved my soul. Like the song said, God. And Lord, you've been walking with me and talking with me and being with me every single day. Uh, God, sometimes I've wandered off or thought I wandered off and God, uh, you was there all the time. Uh, Lord, thank you for that. Uh, Lord, but you brought me back to fellowship. And Lord, I pray uh, tonight, Lord, you'll just deal with the hearts and minds and souls of every man, woman, boy, and girl in this place. Uh, help us to worship your name, sing your praises, and God, I pray you bless the preaching of the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to take this off. Okay. All right, turn to Psalm, get two scriptures in your hand. Get Psalm 103 and Proverbs 21, verse 1 and 2. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 8, and uh, Proverbs 21, uh, verse 1 and 2. And tonight we're going to look about being in his hand. Being in his hand. And oh, by the way, it's his right hand, in case you're wondering. Amen. All right, Psalm 103, verse number 8. Um, the Bible says the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Amen? He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Uh, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. Look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 
1 and 2. And the Bible says this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. The way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Heavenly Father, help us now as we look to you. And God, I pray you just uh, help us to know that uh, if we're saved and born again into the family of God, Lord, that we're in your hand. And God, thank you for your hand. And I pray you just let us leave this place with the assurance of your care in your hand, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, um, there is a, a word uh, that, we, uh, that we use uh, dealing with the hand. And it is the word hold. Uh, now, one of the old forms of hold is holdest. And all that is, is it means to continually hold. Okay? That's what that ending means on that old word. It just means continually. Uh, it's a lot easier to spell than continually. Amen? If you know that, it would save you a lot of grief. Psalm 66, verse number 8 and 9. Bless, O oh bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. He holdeth our soul in life. God holdeth us. Now, I got thinking, what is the most holdingest substance uh, on the face of this earth? Well, it's something called cyanoacrylates. Does anybody know what that is? It's got another name. It's called super glue. That is the holdingest stuff you ever had. You put, uh, uh, you put some super glue between your fingers and let it sit there for a minute and you, you're not going to get your fingers apart for a while. Until it kind of wears over your finger come, finger skin comes off. Uh, now, super glue was invented by this guy named Coover. Uh, like Hoover, except with a C. Harry Coover. And he, walked, uh, he worked for the uh, B.F. Goodrich Company as a scientist. And he was trying to discover a material to make clear gun sights. You know, like in a bomber, you know, and they look through the thing and... And look to drop the bombs, a, 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 a basically a plate of plastic that wouldn't shatter like glass. And uh, I don't know if he ever found what he was looking for, but during that 1942, he stumbled across this stuff that uh, we now call super glue. Well, the War Department didn't have any use for that, and I thought to myself, you know, it's a shame that World War II soldiers didn't have a little bit of super glue with them. That could have saved them a lot of trouble. Putting their gun back together, or their helmets. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about how they couldn't find a use for it. You got to be kidding me! But you know, government agencies. You know, they got to mine this this thick, uh, or this thick. Um, anyway, um, in 1951, he he was working for Kodak, and him and another fellow kind of rediscovered it one day. And he said, "Oh yeah, I discovered this before." And he took it to the company. Well, they were overjoyed with it because. Uh, they were looking for things to stick photographs to the paper and all kinds of things like that. So they started selling it as uh, Eastman 962 or something. And when folks couldn't figure out what Eastman 962 was, they said, well, we're going to sell this because it's not selling very good. And they sold it to a company called Loctite. I know you've heard of Loctite. And uh, they, they started uh, uh, selling it. And, of course, uh, uh, it's been known as crazy glue, super glue, all kinds of things. But uh, uh, beware. Uh, where it goes, it sticks. Amen? <laughs> and I want to say, just like God, just like God, He holdeth you in the palm of His hand. Amen? First of all, I want you to notice that in verse number 10... There in, uh, in uh, uh, Psalm, uh, well, let me get back to Psalm 103. Turn the page. Oh, uh, hers, hers. Hold on just a second. Psalm 103, verse 10. Uh, it, says, it says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, 
nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. Uh, I call that merciful dealing. Merciful dealing. God always deals mercifully with his children. As a matter of fact, he deals mercifully with anybody who will take his mercy. God is a merciful God. Romans chapter 8 verse 34 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Aren't you glad that Jesus is our Savior and He's up at the throne room and He's making intercession for us? Why does He, why does he make intercession for us? Well, uh, besides the fact that He makes His intercession, we'll look at that in a minute, uh, the Bible says that we have no condemnation. We have no condemnation. Look, when you go to a courtroom and the jury comes back and says, Guilty, you're condemned. The judge will pass sentence and you'll go off somewhere to prison or wherever the judge sends you. But the Bible says when we come to Jesus Christ, the Lord is our Savior. He, he puts us in a place of no condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And folks, my soul is walking after the Spirit. And there's no condemnation to my soul. And you know, He does intercede for us. He does. He does intercede for us. Isaiah 53 verse 12 says, Therefore will I divide a portion, uh, divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He had a thief on this side and a thief on that side. And he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You know, I'm a sinner saved by grace, folks. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and every day he's up there making intercession for me. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Wherefore he's able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He, he, look, uh, God says the intercession from Christ is going to stop when he dies. Well, you know what? Guess what? He's never going to die. You say, well, didn't he die? Yeah, he come back. Guess what? This time he ain't going back to the dead. He's alive forevermore. Uh, you know what? That gives us a very special thing. Uh, one of the great dealings, merciful dealings of God with us is that once we're in Christ, there's no separation. Just like the super glue, we're stuck. We are stuck, stuck. Yes, we are. We're stuck. Um... Proverbs, uh, I mean, uh, Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth all our iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like an eagle's. That talks about a an ongoing relationship with God. Just, there's no separation. Whatever we need, He's there to give it to us and help us with it. These people we're praying about, if they're saved, God isn't going to separate from them. You say, what if a Christian does wrong? Well, God may not fellowship. Well, He's not going to separate from them. Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor hype nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No separation. Merciful, merciful dealing. 
a lady wrote this about a conference she was at. Um, she said, I met a woman at a conference who told me she was abused as a small child by her father. She grew up and overcame the emotional damage that he had done and eventually married a missionary. Years later, after her children were fully grown, she received a letter from her father telling her, her he had become a Christian and had asked God for forgiveness and received it. He had moreover realized he had sinned dreadfully against her and was writing to ask for her forgiveness. Feelings she did not know suddenly surfaced. It wasn't fair, she thought. He should pay for what he had done, she thought bitterly. It was far too easy. And now he was going to be a part of the family? She was sure her home church was busy killing the fatted calf for him and that she would be invited to the party. She was angry and resentful. And then the next night she had a dream. She saw her father standing on an empty stage in the dream. Above him appeared the hands of God holding a white robe of righteousness. She recognized it as once, for she was wearing one just like it. As the robe began to ascend toward her father, she woke up crying out, No, it isn't fair! It isn't fair! What about me? The only way she could finally rejoice, as her heavenly father pleaded with her to do, was to realize that her earthly father was now wearing the same robe she was. They were both in the same in God's sight. It had cost his son's life to provide both those robes. She began to see her father clothed with the garments of grace and she was beginning to rejoice for the fact that he was a Christian. Now, that story only goes so far. We don't know what happened after that. But that lady had some tough stuff to go through. And why would you tell us that story? Because I want you to know how God feels about sin. When you sin against God, it must be awfully hard for him to have sent his only begotten son to die for us old rotten, dirty sinners. And you realize the grace and mercy it takes for him to put the robe of righteousness on us when we're saved? Oh, yes. Merciful dealings. And not only that, verse 12 uh, in uh, um, Psalm 103 talks about our sin. Uh, being, uh, I, I say many miles between God and our sin. Many miles between God and our sin. Uh, God has put away our sin, folks. Aren't you glad He put away our sin? Notice that in verse number 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. Now, Give you a little geography lesson. Some of y'all have seen this before. Here we go. Here's a here's a planet Earth. Okay. All right. Now we're gonna draw. That's cool in South America. In case you can't tell. All right. Here we got the north. Here we got the south. Now, if you go. From the South Pole to the North Pole, when does it stop being south? Well, about the equator, and then all of a sudden you're headed to the north. And even if you considered it south, you're still going to hit the north. And you've got to stop talking about the south at that point. And if you go from the north to the south, well, eventually you have to say, well, I'm at the south. But, if you take an aeroplane or a jet and you go around the equator of the planet, you can keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going and you never ever reach the other direction. That's what God means. God has put Hit our sin so far from him, he can just keep going and going and going and going, and he'll never meet our sin ever again. That's good. That's good. I like the fact God can't get a hold of my old dirty sins no more. Not only that, I can't 
get a hold of them either. He's put them as far as the east is from the west. Psalm 17, 7 says, Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand. See, I told you your right hand. Which, uh, uh, them which put their trust in thee, from who that rising up against them. Uh, show thy marvelous kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee, from those that rise up against them. God wants to save you. God wants to put your sin away from you. Even after you get saved, we still sin. And he promises us to forgive us our sin. You know why God does all? Because God is love. God is love. God's love provides this. Y'all know this verse, next, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love saved people. And, and, and it's because of God's love that God does this with our sin. Who paid for that love? Well, Jesus Christ paid for that love. He paid for that love on the cross of Calvary. You know how he paid for it? He paid for it with his very own blood. Amen. That brought us God's salvation. Not only does he do that, but God promises to save those. Uh, he said in the book of Titus, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Look, we're supposed to go out and tell everybody that God will save them. The grace of God has appeared unto all men. Amen. You say, well, how do they see it? We got to go tell them. We got to go show them. We got we to gotta stand up and say, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Amen. The grace of God saves people. And it's God's faith. Do you know that the word faith in the Bible appears 139 times just in the Pauline epistles? There's only a little bit of Pauline epistles in the Bible. 139 times the word faith appears. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Did anybody ever tell you the tale that this boy told about the, uh, the West Texas cottontail and the greyhound? It seems that uh, this boy's daddy got a greyhound dog. Uh, the collies and the, the other little dogs they had there at the farm uh, couldn't keep the vermin down. So he decided to get this fast dog, Greyhound, fastest dog on the planet. And uh, this dog became the scourge of the local jackrabbits. Now you know a jackrabbit. Jackrabbit's a fairly big rabbit. he got big long ears. He, he's pretty fast. But you know, uh, apparently jackrabbits got a, a streak of pride. And so they play chicken with the dog. And uh, sure enough, just about every time them stupid jackrabbits was getting a, they getting the corn, well, they get caught in the corn rows, and that dog could catch them every time. And, and he he was always bringing them a dead jackrabbit, and and uh, pretty soon the, the jackrabbits kind of disappeared from the farm. Um, anyway, um, one day uh, they were going fishing, um, and they brought the dog with them, and. Uh, they were sitting down by the bank, and, and the boy heard the dog barking, and all of a sudden, they saw this little cottontail cross the road behind them. A little cottontail bunny, a little white little bunny. And the dog took, af took out after this little rabbit and uh, got him cornered somewhere in the bush, and all of a sudden, they heard the dog making the weirdest noises. They, he'd never made noises like that. And so he, he said, Dad, I'm going to go find out what's wrong with the dog. So he put his fishing pole down. And he, he, he went back there and to, to find the, uh, 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 where the dog was. And uh, he, he found the dog in front of this big rock about the size of a good-sized four-door sedan. And it had a little crevice, a little thin little crevice that the dog couldn't get into. 
uh, in the middle of this rock, and he looked in the middle of that rock, and there was the rabbit way back in that little crevice, just, just a shaking. And the dark dog, dog was just raising sand, like, come out of here and fight like a rabbit. I want to eat you. Come on. And, and that rabbit wasn't going nowhere. That dog was going crazy because he couldn't get to that little rabbit. He had caught rabbits all, all the time. And so uh, he, he got the dog by the collar and, 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 and he, he led him away. And he, later on he became a Christian and he thought about that little rabbit. And he thought about how God we're hit, hit in the cleft of the rock. Amen? And, and the dog of sin and the devil comes biting after her and he wants to gobble us up and all we got to do is go to Jesus and get in the cleft of the rock and we go, you can't get me. So God has merciful dealings. Many miles are between God and our sin and God always is mindful of our frail frame. Like it or not, folks, we have frail frames. Psalm 103, verse 14 says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Isaiah 41, verse 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You know what God knows about our all frail frame? He knows that we're afraid of things. We fear things. You say, Brother Jeff, I don't fear nothing. Oh, really? I don't, I don't think that's quite true, isn't it? Uh, look, if you were shopping down there at Walmart one day, and all of a sudden some guy came in the store, and he had two machine guns in his hand, and he was shooting at the ceiling, I'd bet you hit the floor. I bet you'd hit the floor. You'd be afraid. It's just a natural thing. Or let's say you were walking in the woods and all of a sudden this, this rabid wolf came right in front of you. You'd be afraid. There's things that we fear and God knows we're afraid. It's a natural part of being a human to be afraid of stuff. Psalm 23, you know the verse, Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. That's why he says that in the Bible, because he knows we're afraid of things. Not only that, he knows our frame is frail, because he knows how weak we are in the flesh. Huh. Yeah, we're weak. Uh, you know, and it's always something. Um... I don't. I, I I bought a new kind of arthritis cream uh, a couple of weeks ago, and all of a sudden I noticed that my skin has started to peel off my fingers. And uh, the only thing I've changed is that stupid arthritis. Guess what? I went and found some of the old stuff and I threw that other way. I bet you this goes away. It's peeling off my skin. So why does it do that? Because it's just frail. And I can't pick at it too much. It'll bleed. Uh, I mean, uh, they're treating my wife on her legs. Well, why do they got to do that? Because her legs are made of flesh. They're frail. And the older we get now, when we're young, we think, oh, I can take anything. Well, you can for a while, maybe, most things. But you get older and the list of what you can't take gets larger and larger and larger all the time. He knows this of us. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You know why God loves the weak and the, and the helpless? Because when they get working for him and then something wonderful happens, people got no choice in saying, that was God. That was God that did that. Finally, he knows we need help. But I want to say one thing, his help has purpose. His help has purpose. Acts 26, 22. Acts 26, 22. The Bible says this, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue 
unto this day, witnessing both to the small and to the great, saying none of the things and those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Paul the Apostle is testifying that God has helped him thus far in his ministry. And I'm here tonight to say God has helped me this far in my ministry. And God has helped you, Christian. And God will continue to help you. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A Christian businessman said he had a surprising evidence of how protective God's Word is uh, and wrote about it in a letter to his friend. He told his friend that he had just attended a meeting of the Chicago camp of the Gideons. Uh, this was back, you know, 80 years ago and was walking along Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago uh, when I was attacked from behind by two youthful bandits who shoved me into an alley and began to rob me. One of them helped himself to my jade scarf pin, but before they located the small amount of money I had with me, the other ran across my New Testament. He said, oh... Here, this guy's a Christian. I guess we hadn't ought to do anything to him. The other said, okay. He handed back the pen in the New Testament and they ran away. But that was back in the days when people were afraid of God. Afraid to do anything to God's people. <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm afraid that don't happen much today. But he did that for that man because he, he knew how frail we are. In conclusion, in conclusion, Psalm 16, <laughs> verse number 11. Psalm 16, if you want to turn there, Psalm 16, verse 11. The last verse in Psalm 16. I got a message about this. It's called the Psalm of 1611. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I want you to notice in conclusion, there are three things in Psalm 16, verse number 11. First of all, there's the path of life. My friend, are you on the path of life? If you are, you're walking with God. Do you have fullness of joy? Boy, there's some days as a Christian I don't know if I had the fullness of joy. But finally I got back to the place where I did because God helped me. And, and you say, well, what if, what if uh, my husband dies or, or what if my husband goes to the hospital or what if my grandma has to be taken to the hospital real quick for church? Uh, look, Look, uh, there's coming a day when the Bible says we're going to have pleasures forevermore. We're going to pass on to the other side, beloved. And we're not going to have to put up with any of this mess on this planet no more. No more. Things are going to be fixed. Why? Because we, my friend, are in His hands. The Bible says, in His hands are the deep places of the earth. Which means you can go and dig a hole as deep as you want. He's there. And the Bible says he fell off the heavens. So you can go as high in a spaceship as you want to go. And he's there. But you know what's best of all? He's right here. He's right here. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not. For I am with thee. Be not dismayed. For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will hold thee. With the right hand of my righteousness. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we're in your hand. And God, thank you that you hold us. And God, one day you're going to deliver us to the heavenly portals, safe and sound, where we're going to live with you forever. Help us to show the way to others. Help us to tell this story. 
And I pray you just give us blessings. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you know our frames. Thank you that you take away our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.